Three, two, one. This is Nick. And this is Amanda. And this is the Performance Plate Podcast, where we give you bite-sized bits of information based on nutrition and exercise science to improve your overall performance. And today we have a sciency of science topics to talk about. It's very, very sciencey, but we'll try and keep it as basic as possible because it's such a cool concept that we're delving into. And it's called nutritional genomics. And I said it yes. right. Yes. <laughs> nutritional genomics. Yes. So nutritional genomics is the broad term for nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics, which we'll be talking about today. And we pulled up a study that we're going to go through um, because the overall message is really cool. And just to give you guys a little bit of a background, nutrigenetics is how genes impact response to nutrition. So a good example of this is how someone breaks down caffeine. So how your body responds to a nutritional um, input. Mm -hmm. And we're actually going to be talking about this specific scenario today, where nutrigenomics is how food and nutrients impact gene expression. So for example, if someone's at risk for diabetes, the food they eat can then influence the activity of that gene. Nice. Which is wild to think about that. Some people, and it it's seen, like some people you even hear them say, like, because we're going to get into caffeine, you hear them talk about how they're like, I don't drink coffee. And you're like, what? Why? And then like, some people just don't drink coffee just because they don't. But other people are like, oh, I feel really funny off of it. And it's like, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe you just, <laughs> maybe you're not crazy. Maybe you just digest it differently and you digest yeah. it and all that stuff. There so are... it's actually wild to think about. <laughs> exactly. And that's what they found through genetic studies is that there are slow metabolizers and there are fast metabolizers. And we just, we just pulled this example, but there are, there's a lot of emerging research around genomics and nutrition and how they impact one another. And um, it's a developing area of science right now that I have a feeling is going to change a lot in the upcoming years. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you're looking at any sort of genetic information, it's important that you're able to evaluate it appropriately. Mm -hmm. And this is where you kind of just want to err with caution right now, because a lot of the science is new and a lot of the scientific data to support the potential mechanisms is still being studied. So when you're looking at genomics, you want to look at the analytical validity of the test. So is the test actually providing correct genetic variation Current technologies have 99.9% accuracy, mm-hmm. but which sounds great, but yeah. is this enough <laughs> when you're testing 1 million SNPs? So that would mean that 0.1% are likely incorrect. And that's about a thousand different genotypes. So that's a I lot. Mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's uh, it creates a lot. It creates false positives and negatives. Negatives would obviously be the worst case um, because then you're missing some information. Yeah where they have no effect. So some companies will run multiple sets to safeguard against this. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other thing you want to look at, you know, is the company certified that the physician is ordering through that you're ordering through? Um, A lot of times you need to order these tests through a practicing physician. I don't really think that you can order them on your own. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you also want to look at the scientific validity. So you, the research needs to be there linking that gene to lifestyle and nutritional changes. So for example, you could study a gene and you could know that it, you know, that something has an impact on it. I'm trying to think of like a good example of this. Um, you know, they've done studies where they understand a mechanism as to like how someone might be absorbing something differently than someone else, but yeah. then is there actually like a lifestyle or nutrition stimulus that can make a difference? Like that's a whole nother component that needs to be studied in addition to the actual mechanism of why someone might be absorbing yeah. something differently. Yeah, yeah. So there's three different classifications of research. There's convincing, probable, and then possible. Okay. And there's, you know, there's a range when it comes to the things that we've studied so far. Yeah. So with caffeine in particular, that's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> our um, favorite, everybody's our, favorite. Yes. And <laughs> what's, what's your, what's your take on caffeine? I'm curious. Oh, I mean, it's very, depends on how much you need it. So I'm very, I have like my cup in the morning and then I have my cup in the late morning, we'll say, cause I get up at five. So my late morning is around 10 or 11 and I try to limit caffeine till, uh, nothing after 2 PM. Gotcha. Uh, try to is a key word because I just thoroughly enjoy the taste of coffee and uh-huh. 
decaf just does not taste the same. I'm sorry. It doesn't. <laughs> oh, I agree. Was uh, there ever a time where you were drinking three or four cups a day? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I went, I went to grad school. Come on. And I was bodybuilding. Um, yeah. <laughs> so energy drinks, coffee, pre-workouts, caffeine was just a super important stimulus that I thought I needed. But then as I started to wean off every so often, um, I realized I didn't need it as much. So I don't know. And at a certain point, which reading the articles made me really interested in it as well, because I'm like, wait, do I metabolize it super slow? Cause I get nothing out of it. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So I'm like kind of curious of mine, what I actually may get out of it. But I think a lot of us, I think it's part of our routine more than we actually need it. That's my actual yes. opinion of it is like, I think it's yeah. part of our routine more than we actually are taking it in for any type of benefits or not benefits, because a lot of people have their morning coffee, but their morning coffee is not just coffee. It's cream, sugar. It's like they're, their breakfast, which yeah, you know, me and you don't agree with having your coffee as your breakfast, but <laughs> some people do do that. No, that's the best thing you could do for yourself. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, please. <laughs> coffee on an empty stomach is a big no for yes. many reasons. Um, but yeah, no, it, I think it's especially in our society, I think it's so ingrained coffee, 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 like everything revolves around coffee. Everyone loves coffee. So yeah. we kind of just start doing it. Like I just started drinking coffee. And then before I knew it, I was having four cups a day. Yeah. I didn't think anything of it. My favorite question is why do you need it? Like, why do you, why are you having the crashes? Why are you mm -hmm. tired diving yeah. into those reasons? If that's the reason you're drinking it, you know, it's kind of, it's different if you're having it for more of like a comfort taste type thing. Cause yes. some cultures like growing up Italian, we had caffeine after dinner, yeah. which yeah. yeah. <laughs> Espresso, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's so, true. You're, you're right with that. It's like different reasons. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Love and it. But if you're having it because you need to stay awake or because you're super tired all the time, then it's actually diving into why are you tired all the time? Do you, yes. are you getting enough nutrients? Are you getting yeah. enough sleep? Are you working out appropriate amounts? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where like, fun? yeah. Yes. And that's where I think people replace, oh, let me just have more coffee because I'm tired. But like, yes, you have a big meal and you're tired. For lunch, one, I know you're not supposed to be extremely tired after every meal you eat. Yes. That would not be a good thing. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing that and then you're just like, oh, well, I need my afternoon coffee. Do you need your afternoon coffee? Or are you just tired from your meal? So that means your digestion is not that great. Mm -hmm. That could be why you think you need your afternoon coffee. So like, mm -hmm. but a lot of it comes down to routine. So the question, and that's why I love your question of why do you need that? Just like when I'm at the gym and someone's saying, oh, I need to take my pre-workout do you need the pre-workout right now? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you're just, you are so run down. It, it, it's what you need. But other times it's like, is it just- You're your so passion? run down. Why are you in the gym? <laughs> That's fair. That's also a good point. <laughs> um, so you never know of why that is. Like you never, like some people, it's just part of the routine as more yeah. just like, and then you don't realize all the effects that that caffeine can have on you without realizing it. Like if yeah. you can't sleep at yes. night, you work out so late and you're taking pre-workout. Pre -workout. <laughs> well maybe don't take pre-workout at 8 p.m at night and try yeah or day. maybe start doing it in the morning yes. you know going to bed a little bit earlier waking up earlier yeah we could well I mean we'll talk about that after we yes. dive into the study so um because I know one of your questions was like we should definitely you know talk about other forms of mm -hmm. other things that can give someone energy if they yes. feel like they're struggling yes. um so we will get there mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so when we're thinking about caffeine detox there is a detoxifying enzyme called cytochrome P450 A12, otherwise, no, otherwise known as CYP A12. And um, over 95% of caffeine detox is carried out by this enzyme. Mm -hmm. So of course, when they started looking at nutritional genomics, they were like, this would be a good enzyme to look at. And they found that genetic variation exists within this gene. So- right variant alleles led to reduced enzymatic activity, which meant that some people don't um, use this enzyme as efficiently or as quickly. So those that carried the C allele specifically had reduced CYP uh, 1A2 activity. Yeah. Which otherwise is known as slow caffeine metabolizers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <Breaking laughs> so they have, 
yeah, three different genotypes. If you've ever studied science before, even if you just, you know, know the, if you studied um, science in high school, even I yes. think they cover the, the Punnett square with, with the different Mendelian square. Yes. It's beautiful. Mendelian square. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. I have like a weird, I remember it so vividly. It's so weird. The peas. Like, yes. I do the random pun. Yeah. With the peas, I'll do the blood type. Okay. And my mom's like, Hey, what, how do you know what blood type I am? And I'm like, well, what's, what's, what's grandma? What's grandpa? Let's put it together. And you're probably. That one's a little more confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a nerd. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, yeah, so that's exactly what we're talking about here. So individuals yeah. with the AA genotype are known as fast caffeine metabolizers, while those that have the C allele or are homozygous for the C allele, so you could be AC or CC, mm -hmm. are known as slower caffeine metabolizers. So they wanted to, so, okay, this would be an example where they found a variation in the gene and they found yeah. different enzymatic activity in that. Now they need to go and apply that to actual diet and lifestyle changes to see mm -hmm. if there's any influence there. Yeah. Um, and that was something that I was talking about before. Like you need to make sure that that research is also there when you're talking about these genes. Yeah. So there was a Costa Rica health study done on 2000 heart attack survivors. They mm -hmm. took these survivors and they matched them to control subjects by age, sex, and then area of residence. Uh, these people, the control people had not suffered heart attacks. Mm -hmm. So research ob obtained uh, coffee intake, lifestyle, and other health habits from the participants. And then they genotyped everyone for this gene. Um, also, just important to note that the caffeine in this study was highly caffeinated. Yeah, so, <laughs> I saw that. I was like, dude, yes. I, want <laughs> I, want, I want I want I want what they're taking. <laughs> Let's see what yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what the brand was or anything like that, but just know <laughs> that it was highly caffeinated. Um, and before, okay, so this is what, what's really interesting about this study before the genotyping was taken into consideration. So mm -hmm. when they just took the two groups, the, uh, the data actually so showed an association between coffee intake, um, that was roughly J shaped. So those that consumed four plus cups per day had an increased risk for heart attack compared to those that consumed no coffee. Yeah. So at first they're just like, oh, you know, maybe it doesn't have to do with the gene, maybe yeah, whether or not, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. It just looks like if you drink a, t a ton of coffee, you're at an increased risk for a heart attack. Yeah. But, and they purposely did this, they purposely did that first and then compared it to when the genotypes were considered, a new graph showed that the AA genotypes, the fast metabolizers, did not have a significant increased risk for heart attack with higher coffee intake. So when, yeah, and then they showed that the slower metabolizers had an increased risk when consuming two plus cups per day. So the study was actually able to separate the two and see mm -hmm. that the curve um, wasn't, wasn't giving you the whole picture. Yeah. And if you break that down into genotypes, there actually were differences between them. Yeah. And when I read this, it had me thinking, you know, there's so many contradictory studies out there where like, it says something says one thing and then something else says another thing. Like even with the whole, the blue light and the before yeah. bed, I've yeah, yeah. been seeing other studies that have come out about, you know, it's fine. It's not a big deal. Melatonin goes back to normal levels after 15 minutes where other studies are like, no, these people are up all night long. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah. why is there discrepancies there? Right. It doesn't make sense. But yeah. what they're fine, what they're trying to do is fill these gaps in with genomics yeah. and nutritional genomics specifically and seeing, okay, is this what's accounting for those differences and why, um, you know, some people might respond this way while others might not. Yeah. Um, so that's why, you know, I thought this study was really cool because they actually pulled that apart and looked at it. Yeah. Um, which is wild. Like <laughs> they could actually show you that. Okay. Well, listen, um, that the slow met slow metabolizers seem to have, uh, an increased risk if they have more caffeine through the day, which means the caffeine effect is like the half-life of the caffeine half-life is just how much it breaks down for people that don't know, um, or how quickly it breaks down and it stays in your system. They're just, it's in their system longer. So you probably don't need as much throughout the day, even though you may feel like you need it, mm -hmm. but there could be other factors telling you that that's what was really cool. And it seems if from Punnett square nerdiness and the Mendelian <laughs> genetics and stuff like that, the fact that AA is the slow, right? AA is a slow metabolism, slow metabolism. That's a fast one. Fast, fast. fast. Okay. Yeah. So the AA is a fast one, but if on a Punnett square, there's four squares, one, two, three, four. AA is in the top left corner, we'll say. And then the other two 
the top right, the bottom left would be AC, which our heterozygous is known as, um, which had that thing for a slower metabolism. And then CC would be the slower metabolism as well. So it's like, wait a second. It seems like there's more slower metabolism people as yeah. well as fast metabolism people. Mm -hmm. So the, it, like the, the, it's just cool to think about like, like I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you're like, hold on, if we break that down, that's three fourths, 75%. There's a chance that those people are slower metabolizers than faster metabolizers. Uh huh. And then when you bring that <laughs> big picture, yeah. of like, wait, how many people oh, take in the same amount of caffeine and they have no idea of this. It's like, wait, whoa, do you need your caffeine? Yeah. Is there any reasons why you're so tired and all that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think four cups is excessive, no matter who you are. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> coming from, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. And honestly, the point of even talking about this wasn't even to like, like give targeted advice, because obviously no one that's listening probably knows what, yeah. what they are, you know, for this gene. They probably no don't idea. know their real type. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just the fact that like, this might start to bring this might start to um, fill the gaps between mm -hmm. like why someone responds differently than someone else and yes. highlight how individualized nutrition is. Mm -hmm. Even as, you know, I mean, anything is this way. Like I'm sure you see with your clients, two people could have a hip replacement and they respond totally differently and yes. their recovery looks totally different. Yeah. yeah. I see it the same with nutrition. People respond differently to different foods mm -hmm. and it's really important to respect that yeah the, the individuality of it and also like if you're someone that is totally caught up in all of the information that's out there on the internet and you're like oh my god what do I follow what do I do yeah start by listening to your own body first yes well that's that's where you have to you can fight an uphill battle against yourself by just not listening to yourself yes yes you know? <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's it's something like and why like yes you said that the whole purpose of this was not to be like oh take in less caffeine we all drink too it's not that's not the purpose of this whole conversation it's just the the broad topic and we use this one specifically because it was really cool but the broad topic of if you're noticing something doesn't work for you but everyone around you it's just the way you've always done it doesn't mean it's the way you need to do it mm -hmm. an example would be like every time you notice everybody that goes to the gym drinks a pre-workout and they all use, let's say the same brand of pre-workout. And you notice that it gives you heart palpitations and flutters and all that stuff. Yeah. You probably don't need that one. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or same thing as you drink one cup of coffee in the morning and you just don't feel right all day long and you're anxious and whatever. It's like, but your whole family drinks the cup of coffee. So you just pour yes. it. That's what everyone does. You may be one of those people that just does it slower it metabolizes it. and it yeah. just does not help you. And yeah. in a good way, does not help you. So like, that was the whole premise of what we were thinking, where it's like, this is a really cool thing about genomics and how we can fill the gaps. Like, yes, nobody knows. No one's going to be like, ah, Nick and Amanda say, go get their genotype done. Like, no, we <laughs> not say this. we're saying though, there's, there's the human body is so different for every person that there's mm -hmm. similarities, but at the same time, sometimes people are different and what works for you may not work for others. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about too, like other energy sources. And mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, if you're someone that is chronically exhausted and relying on caffeine and yeah. potentially worried about cardiovascular health, mm -hmm. then it's important to provide your body with all the essential nutrients. That's where I would start is yeah. like making sure that you are getting enough fuel and not just fuel, but like nutrient dense whole foods. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Especially <laughs> those B vitamins. Yes. Um, I would make sure you're hydrating. Mm -hmm. You could improve your bedtime and morning routine. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you are kind of sporadically going to bed or you're watching TV until you fall asleep mm -hmm. and there's not, you know, could be 1 a.m. It could be 10 p.m. Yeah. Um, it's important to like double check on your habits there. Mm -hmm. If you want to start being more consistent or relaxing a little bit more before you go to bed, maybe you try to go to bed with racing thoughts and then you're yeah. waking up throughout the night. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. So finding a good routine for yourself, getting outside during the day, doesn't matter whether it's sunny or not, as long as you're getting outside, sun can go through those clouds. Yeah. So you might not feel it on your face, but it's mm -hmm. there. Yep. Uh, that's yep. really important. Moving your body. Just getting basic movement it doesn't need to be anything crazy, but walking, stretching, like yep. 
just moving. So, so important. If you can get a workout in even better, um, lighten your load. If you're a super stressed out person, like where can you eliminate some things? Not everything is necessary in this moment. Mm -hmm. Sure. You can say no to some things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, (laughs) uh limit alcohol a lot of Mm -hmm. people have pretty screwed up cortisol patterns going from the weekend to the weekdays so like if you're someone that's up till three o'clock in the morning friday saturday night and then all of a sudden you're trying to go to bed at 9 p.m on a sunday it's probably gonna be pretty hard and you're probably gonna be pretty screwed up so like maybe limiting alcohol or at least like finding more of a routine with your weekends Mm -hmm. um, can be really important yeah. And then you can always use teas. You can always use like black tea or green tea that do contain some caffeine. Mm-hmm. And that's the, there's so many other ways. And that's why, like, when you started of the question you ask when people are like, oh, like, why are you drinking coffee? And it's, mm-hmm. or why do you need the caffeine intake? Like, why do you need to pick me up? And the question is sometimes, yeah, your, your sleep patterns are just not there. A lot of times it can be your sleep patterns. You're just not in a routine of sleeping. Um, and you want to try and make that as routine as possible. Yes, people have different jobs. Yes, sometimes people are uh, graveyard shift people. They work overnight. So they're why to sleep at different times is harder. There's those aspects of it. But can you try to find some type of normalcy? Um, or even the hydration thing is a huge factor too. We also, you have to remember, if you are drinking more things with caffeine in them, you do have to hydrate more too. Mm-hmm. So like, not only that, but that could affect your sleep you're not hydrated enough you know there's so many different things where i'm sure you've drank i remember when i was first started uh in clinical after i graduated got my license all that stuff i met one of these aides that was i was working with and she's like oh yeah i don't drink coffee and once again i was like what <laughs> are you insane like how do you yeah not- i know i never thought i would be the type of person that didn't need to rely on it well and that's where she's like i drink a cold glass of water every morning and i'm good to go and i was like all right, you're lying. There's no way. And she's like, no, I really, I don't feel. And she was saying, I don't feel good when I drink coffee. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you're crazy. Whatever. I don't know. Anyway. So like, yeah, there's those, you there's might those not even know that you feel better without it. And it's worth a shot trying. It, yes. it might be uncomfortable at first. Trust me. Yeah. The first time I came off of it, my headaches were unreal. I had to, cause my cortisol was so screwed. Yeah. Uh, just like my, I mean, it was just something that helped me start sleeping better too, because yeah. I was drinking it all day long, but super uncomfortable first week, second week started to get better. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, I feel yeah. great. Yes. So yeah, it's, can definitely, it's, definitely worth a shot. It is. Um, if you don't want any, if you ask yourself why you're using it, you know what I mean? Or why not using it? Cause it's not really why you're taking in coffee so much in the morning or just caffeine in general. Like if you ask yourself that question of like, yes. oh, well, why? that can tell you a lot. Yeah. Because to be honest with you, I don't need my coffee in the morning. It's part of my routine. I like the taste as part of my routine, but there are some mornings like I, if I can't sit down and enjoy my cup of coffee where like I actually can watch whatever, like after I do my reading and all that stuff, if I could just watch like a catch up show or whatever I want to do in the morning for like 10, 20 minutes. If I can't do that while drinking my coffee, I won't have my coffee. Mm-hmm. So I know I don't, don't yeah, I don't, I know I don't need it. If I have to get out the door yes. to get to an early patient, I just leave it. I forgo it. And then I move on with my day. I drink my water. And yep. yeah, I will have a headache by like 10, but I'll have a, a cup of coffee by 10 and then the headache will go away. But then again, <laughs> did I need it then? Probably not, but I want the headache to go away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Some I reliance there because that headache is popping up. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's important to just like, as we wrap up to with, with nutritional genomics, if you do end up coming across it, remember mm-hmm. that it is just another tool yes. and it's not an end all be all. I yes. think it's really important that like, even for nutritionists or physicians that do use it, that they use it in a way that empowers the client mm-hmm. or empowers the patient and rather than scaring them or disappointing them. Yes. Um, because you remember like, you know, if you're, if you find out that you have a gene for something there's still things that can influence that gene. Like there's so much that goes into this and it's not a tell all be all. And it like, you would never look at someone's genomics and be like, Oh, like come to conclusions or make up a plan just based off of that. You would look at their lifestyle, Mm -hmm. their biofeedback, their lab work. Like it's all these things in combination that can really make a solid, solid uh, plan for someone. Yes. And it's just like, we've been saying this whole time. It's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not, it's not a whole picture. Just right. one little thing. If it's actually like, I would say there's these things in like 
you can say a diagnosis of ex exclusion. That's not this case, but it's an exclusion. Like, okay, we're doing all this stuff and something's not, we're like 98% there. What are we missing? And then the gen genomics can come into the fact of like that. Ah, there it that is. is yes. There it is. That's what Yeah, we're it could be, I have a feeling it's going to be a really valuable tool in the future, in the future. Of course. I think so yeah. too. It sounds so cool. Um, it's so interesting in what it can actually do and tell you. Um, but like the moral of the story with this whole thing is like, yeah, we talked about caffeine today just because that was the research article we focused on, but it's kind of moral of it. Just listen to yourself. If you know, question sometimes why you're doing certain things. If you don't need that, like if you have a snack every single night that like, doesn't make you feel good digestion wise, why are you doing that? Is it, fami mm -hmm. is it familiar? Is it, were you used to that every night as a kid, you had warm milk and whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, so like kind of question some things like, oh, this never made me feel good anyway. So maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe you don't need that, you know? Yes. Yes. hundred percent. So this was awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Such cool topics. Um, I can't wait till we dive more into it again at some point, because it's actually really cool what's coming out with this stuff. And we're not saying don't, we're literally, we're not saying you can't have caffeine. We're just saying, think about sometimes what you're doing and why you're doing it and mm -hmm. how cool this stuff is. And maybe your genes are not meant to be like the person next to your genes. Maybe you're not meant to train like the person next to you. Maybe eat the, yeah. like the person next to you. What works for them might not work for you, might not work for the next person, but then it works for this person over here. Exactly. So uh -huh. you never know. So we're saying just be open-minded to things being different for you and that's okay. Yeah. So thank you again. Another awesome episode of the Performance Plate Podcast. If you guys enjoyed this, please um, give us a review on Spotify. Please like, share it, tell your friends, do all that fun stuff because we love educating and helping everybody. So until next time, thank you again, Amanda. Thanks. <laughs>